Similar for uh, residential properties, as these trees age out, they will be replaced by things that are more appropriate uh, and taking views into <coughs> account. Uh, the city is also creating a database for trees, and I think it would behoove the Homes Association to do something similar for private property, where you could identify something like a heritage tree, you could identify uh, trees that will be obstructing, excuse me, obstructing obstructing a view maybe in 10 years if it doesn't obstruct one now. And um, then as, as residences uh, are sold, uh, you know, you can go in and say, hey, you know, this tree is going to be a problem in five years. Um, I have issue with trees that get into people's sewer systems. So there's a lot of issues around trees. Um, and that's one of the things I'd like to explore. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, as uh, Phil pointed out, the Homes Association has a, uh, a limited capability to uh, handle view disputes as they relate to, uh, to trees and vegetation. Uh, and I think it's working well uh, based on the number of uh, issues that come up. It's uh, relatively small. So that tells me that a lot of the things that are issues are settled neighbor to neighbor uh, without any higher uh, uh, entity uh, reaching into them. Where they can't be done that way, uh, there's a process. Uh, the city, uh, as of right now, has not come down on the side of creating an ordinance. There have been other cities on the hill that have attempted that. Some have uh, uh, had them and uh, later found that they didn't want them. So it's an issue and uh, I personally don't have a, a good solution. Uh, I think we're making baby steps, but those are necessary to get where we're going. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cozen. Yes, th there certainly has been uh, a number Sorry. of issues uh, with views uh, to take into account, and I think the Palsbury's Homes Association has done a good job of helping neighbors, our members, resolve these issues together. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question goes to um, Ms. Cozen. Um, should residents get to vote on watershed, on watershed changes to parklands, like the Beautify Lunata Bay plan to completely, the, to completely transform every bluff top in Lower Lunata Bay? Should the members Should of the residents get to vote on the watershed changes to parklands, like the Beautify uh, Lunata Bay plan? I think that, um, that uh, the Homes Association should take into account what the members, um, I don't know if it would be a, a vote per se, but certainly be out in the community and take a poll and get information of, of what the members would like to do because this, that's what we're doing. It's for the members. Mr. Schott. Uh, I believe this is a city matter, um, and I believe this particular project uh, was reviewed by the Parklands Committee, and it was decided on by um, possibly the, um, the city of PVE. So as far as the uh, Homes Association, uh, it would have limited involvement. However, um, Phil, maybe you can let me know on this, but did you donate, uh, did the Homes Association donate some money for this project? No, we did not. Okay, so I wasn't clear on that. But uh, so um, anyway, if people are concerned about what's happening in Lanada Bay, there's certainly, they have the right to appear at the Parklands Committee. They can write letters. They can contact their, um, their councilman. Uh, so there's certainly ways that they can um, present their views if they would like to see something different happen. Thank you. Mr. Franks. So Reed and I uh, astonishingly agree on something. Um, the this is my understanding of the plan. It, it, there was a presentation made to us by members of the um, Winata Bay Homeowners Association about this project on a pilot basis. Um, the Homes Association listened to it. We chose not to act on it because we weren't clear that there was overall community support of it. 
the projects has gone has gone ahead without the homes association's involvement which is appropriate because it is basically city parkland and we no longer have authority over the parkland uh, and its uses unless there is misuse of it so to speak um, and so in this particular case you know they're they're not developing buildings on it it's not under our jury review um, and so our revision reversionary rights wouldn't come into play but certainly it's an issue for everybody that lives in the community and the uh, parkland committee would be the appropriate place and the city council to to uh, discuss that thank you mr moody i believe the original question had to do with watershed and that that's a very technical subject and i think it belongs in the purview of the city. Okay, uh, Ms. Breen. Um, it's true that it is a city project. It does not belong in the Homes Association, but I can shed a little bit of light on the project. Um, it actually exceeded due process. There were numerous community meetings. There were, um, um, you know, the typical parklands meeting and, and uh, city council meetings where it was approved. Um, and the, uh, the objections to the project actually came very late in the game. And if those people had contributed or decided to participate early on, I think maybe there could have been a different outcome. Uh, but it's down to the same thing. Uh, if we can't get 50% of the people to vote for who's on the Homes Association, how are you going to get people to vote for something on a watershed project? So it, it boils down to community involvement again. And you got to kind of, uh, if you believe in something, you got to get out there and participate, not just talk about it. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Hoffman. You don't need to press the button. I, my answer is no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, there's a related question here. It just asks, do you support the city approved concept plan for changes to parkland, uh, also known as the beautify Lunata Bay? So it's, a, it's, an issue, it's a question regarding whether you support the concept. Perhaps you could uh, uh, respond to that. I think we begin with Mr. Frangs. Um, personally, I would prefer the, um, the, the bluffs to be kept natural, so I do not support it. Mr. Moody. This project has been a subject of a lot of discussion and study and debate for a year or so, and I don't think it would be appropriate to comment now on whether we think it should go forward or not. Okay. It's done. Green. Uh Changes to parkland is actually a city process. And the Lunata Bay pilot is a specific project that went through that process. And so um, I do support the project, obviously. And um, as a pilot, I think we will learn some very important things about our parkland areas that, although they may be called natural, they are actually um, deteriorating they are not natural. There's very little native planting left in our, in our areas. And that pilot project is not necessarily going to cover the entire bluffs. Again, this is a, this is a learning experience. And we're also hoping to um, create better stewardship for our open spaces and reduce some of the city cost of maintaining these areas and hoping to mitigate erosion. So there are, there's a whole slew of um, potential benefits that can come out of this educational project. So thank you. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, let's see, uh, I am uh, somewhat distantly familiar with uh, what the concept was uh, because it came before the Homes Association now probably a year and a half or something like that. But since that point in time, uh, I haven't followed it. So I don't think I could uh, really have a informed, I, I do believe that it is something that's a city matter at this point, uh, but I don't think I would like to venture a, an informed yes or no on that. Thank you. Cozen? Yes. Um, I think the presentation of this was done before I was on the board, so I wasn't privy to it, but I do prefer the natural beauty of the cliffs as is. Mr. Schott. Um, I believe this is outside of the purview of the Homes Association. It's a city matter, like a couple of the uh, other people have mentioned. Um, so um, I, I also like the natural look of the uh, 
the bluffs, but I think there are some issues, uh, as Marlene um, mentioned, that there's a lot of some invasive plants. There's not a, not a lot of natural habitat. Um, you go over to Terranea, not that we should approach anything like Terranea, but they do, uh, and also the Land Conservancy, but they have made efforts to try to resource, restore some native plants, and I think as far as uh, from a watershed or if there's here, I don't have the expertise on this, but if we have the proper people with expertise uh, to recommend things that are approved by the local residents, um, then, but here again, it's a city matter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question um, begins with Mr. Frangs. Uh, in the PV Homes Association appeal of a court decision that their sale of parkland to an individual was illegal, the attorneys for the Homes Association are arguing that the deed restrictions that protect the parkland are irrelevant because covenants over a decade earlier allow for the selling or buying of parkland. Why do you believe the Homes Association should or should not be to sell, should not be able to sell or buy land for parkland in the future? Should I re read that again? No, no, it's fine. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> the argument that lawyers make for either side are unique and technical, so I can't comment on lawyers' arguments uh, by any means. The Homes Association believes that we had the authority for that particular transaction. That's what's being litigated. So we have to wait and find out what the appellate court's uh, decision is, is whether we did in fact have the authority to do that or we didn't. And that's the only thing that's really of of matter right now is what the court decision is. Mr. Booty? This issue on the sale of parkland is the 400 pound canary and I'm extremely disturbed by it. Uh, there have been representations made by members of the Homes Association that there was never a sale of parkland. Now I have here a document a memorandum of understanding where it specifically says, it's a, the, the, the MOU is written between the city, the Homes Association, and the school district. In this MOU, it specifically says the Homes Association shall sell area A, shall sell it. And any representation that they didn't sell it uh, can't really be uh, identified in mixed company language. It, it, it's, it's terrible. I have here a copy of the deed that was sold, and I have here a copy of the court judgment that said that sale had to be undone and was illegal. Excuse me. End of subject. Time is up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Breen? Um, Regardless of uh, the convoluted arguments of the lawyers, I have an ethical issue with what happened there. You have a resident that for 10 years ignored notices about encroachments, and he was rewarded by being allowed to annex parkland to his property, and that's just wrong. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, let's see. I for a lot of reasons, uh, we'll kind of pass on this. However, I will uh, state unequivocally that uh, if the same circumstances were here, again, uh, that were present uh, now seven, eight years ago, uh, I would uh, vote for the memorandum of understanding. Uh, again, very unique circumstances. Uh, Beyond that, I will say, but it, it was in no way setting a precedence in my mind or as far as I know anyone else's mind that uh, parkland was up for sale. Ms. Cozen? Yes, this, um, I was not on the board at that time, um, but I do know the current board members, nobody believes in selling parkland. Here, here. Thank you. Mr. Schott. Um, in response to the question, I believe that the deed restrictions would trump the covenant's uh, right to sell parklands uh, because they occurred about 14, 15 years later. Also, if you take a look at the minutes 
of the Homes Association. Um, there was a um, concern when they passed those deed restrictions. They wanted to be sure, they felt as though the parkland that was set aside by the Olmstead uh, Associates, um, that they did it for a reason, that it was calculated, that it, that it made sense, that they had a lot of expertise in that area, and they wanted it preserved. So when you start to sell off parkland to an individual, um, as Marlene said, uh, and rewarding someone that had encroachments for, I think it was even more than 10 years, maybe 20 years, uh, it's, it's inappropriate. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we begin with Mr. Moody now. Um, still, still land use issues, but uh, the question is, will you support efforts to enhance trails, bluffs, and other parklands to encourage greater usage? It depends, in my view, on the wear and tear of the, the bluffs and the, the trails. Dr. Allen at uh, Caltech said many years ago that eventually our bluffs are, they are subject to normal coastal erosion and our bluffs are going to disappear. So I think we have to take good care of them and uh, I think what RPV has done is remarkable over there. It's a joy to walk around Terranea and uh, the, the Conservancy area. We could learn something from that, but it has to be done with care and not just uh, throw it open to <coughs> motorcycles and bikes and horses. We need to preserve what we have. Thank you. Spring? Um, I think kind of the unintended message or the intended <coughs> message here when they say greater usage, um, I think a lot of residents are concerned about people from other areas coming and using our parkland. And I don't want that mindset to interfere with me being able to enjoy my parkland. And I think sometimes we end up with a case of kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face. And um, having an understanding of landscape and, and habitats and how natural cycles work. Um, I think that we can do things to benefit our parkland. I think we really need to look at better stewardship of our parklands so that they can not only be preserved, but so that they can thrive and, uh, and be a benefit, not for us here today, but for our children and whoever the residents will end up being in 10 years, 50 years, 100 years from now. And uh, we have a community that has a legacy, and we should respect that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, let's see if memory serves me. Uh, the uh, city was trying to develop a trails usage policy or ordinance or something. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't think it ever got uh, approved. Uh, a lot of discussion and everything, a lot of wordsmithing. Uh, I think it's a touchy subject uh, in terms of uh, control and usage. Uh, I would tend to agree with uh, Marlene that I, th I, I tend to be a little parochial that says it's a character that, uh, this, that is very unique to this city. Uh, having people come in and use it, uh, I'm not exclusive. Uh, but uh, again, I would hate to see uh, bicyclists, for instance, uh, you know, mountain biking and all of that in trails that I'm aware of uh, that are proximate to my location. So I think it's a touchy subject. Cozen. Um, most of our members that have uh, discussed this issue with me have been more in favor of protecting our parklands and not inviting um, outside communities in. Mr. Schott. Um, again, as far as developing trails um, in other areas of parkland, it's a city matter. It doesn't really, it's not a purview, again, of the Homes Association. Um, as far as uh, personally, um, 
I like our trails. I think a lot of people like to walk them, use them for recreation. Um, I don't think that that should be um, done away with, by, um, but at the same time, you need to have respect for the privacy and security of the people adjacent or nearby, nearby the trails. So it's, um, it's again, it's a, it's a balance issue, um, but we, we are lucky to have all these parklands. And um, there is also an issue of safety, I think, uh, is that some of the trails, um, maybe they do need to be improved a little bit. Uh, maybe not improved, but just to have better maintenance a little bit so they don't really create uh, some liabilities or some hazards. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Franks. Um, I think the community for 90 plus years has enjoyed parkland as a quiet area. Uh, I'm not interested personally. I don't think it's a homes association issue, but I'm not interested personally in development of our parkland for recreational use because I do think it creates a destination and the unintended consequences of creating a destination in Palos Verdes is, is that we will lose some of the character that we have right now that we've loved for so many years. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the, the next question asks, and this is from the audience, I have experienced gross inefficiency and disorganization at the <coughs> Palos Verdes Homes Association. It's directed to challengers, but if you others wish to I, I didn't understand. Could you read okay, the first part of it? I have experienced. Is that what you said? Sorry. At the counter. Read the I'll, I'll first read sentence again. again. Yes. I have experienced gross inefficiency and in disorganization at the Palos Verdes Homes Association. Okay. Thank it's you. Directed to challengers, but others may respond as well. Um, what administrative experience do you bring to the table? I think that's been answered to some degree by by a few. Give examples <coughs> of results. So the issue is inefficiency and disorganization and how to solve that problem. That, that was the perception of somebody. So I think we begin, um, I lost my place here, uh, with Mr. Moody. Well, the behavior of any uh, corporate entity and its employees is really set by the board of directors and the president. And if there's a problem, it should be addressed by management and taken care of. Uh, I've heard a lot of complaints. I've not, as I said earlier this evening, I haven't had anyone rush up to me and tell me how wonderful they think the Homes Association is. If there are complaints and problems, then they should be addressed by management. Ms. Breen. I do think some of the processes could be improved. Um, I submit projects on a regular basis, and some of them go through great. Other ones hit a lot of glitches. And um, I, think, uh, I think there's some room for improvement in the system. And um, it's true, behavior comes from the top down in any organization. And um, the Homes Association is there to serve the residents. They're not there to um, sort of lord over them or, or make things difficult. They're there to facilitate good architecture, good community. And I think that uh, we can do a little bit more of that. Being Thank you. Mr. Hoffman. Uh, let's see, uh, quite frankly, that it does and it doesn't come a little as a surprise to me. Uh, there are roughly in any given uh, month if memory is serving me correctly, uh, about three or 400 uh, counter experiences, if you will, uh, on a monthly basis uh, there at the Homes Association. And I can't remember in the seven years that I've been there uh, a communication that has said somebody left, uh, well, I won't say unsatisfied, but but really tore, if you will. Uh, so, you know, we would be, I would be uh, certainly interested in, uh, in what, uh, let's see, let me interrupt there. There is an initiative going on right now of which I'm a part and others are too, but a coordinated activity between the city and uh, the Homes Association to try and improve some of these processes and everything like that. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, Ms. Cozen. Yes, if we're talking about um, just walk-ins at the Palos Verdes Homes Association, I'm in and out of there often, and I find it very personal 
the, the staff there is very passionate about what they do, and I think they give very personal service to everybody that walks in and spends as much time as is needed. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Schott. Um, I'm not sure how it would be helpful if the question was more specific on the inefficiencies that the person encountered and what the problems were, so it's, it's pretty general. Um, in some being empathetic to the situation, I've actually had three situations with the art jury involving my home. Uh, one, actually the most recent, was handled very easily to install solar panels on my home. So it went very well and the people at the front counter were uh, very amenable and uh, very helpful. But two other situations I had, especially the one several years ago, I lost many nights of sleep over inconsistencies in the approval from the art jury. Um, I was given an approval and then the next time I just wanted to make some minor changes maybe with the way windows opened or the type of window. I was told that then I had to change like a door entrance or something else and apparently at that time uh, I was told that the association has the right to change their opinion on prior approvals. So I think that can be very frustrating and that needs to change if, that's, if it hasn't already. Okay, Mr. Franks. Um, over the over the term that that I've served, which has been this long term that you all have have commented on, um, I think the the experience for customers at our counter has improved dramatically. If in fact the person who wrote that card has a, a who would like to discuss this with me after, I'd be more than happy to follow up on it because, by and large, uh, my understanding, and as a board member. Um, I'm not there every day. Our staff is there every day, and our staff can certainly um, handle things, and our manager can take complaints, and, and we can deal with things. But certainly my experience has been that the, um, the staff does a great job, and they are under a lot of pressure, time pressure, to get things done. And um, if there's a misunderstanding, I apologize. And if somebody would like to, to um, after the meeting, just come to me privately and tell me about it, I'll be more than happy to look into it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the next question asks, and we'll begin with Ms. Breen, um, is the Homes Association com considered a community association and governed by the California Guidelines for Community Associations and the Davis-Sterling Act? I'd like you to talk to Phil about that one. <laughs> I'm happy to answer. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the Palos Verdes Homes Association is a mutual benefit corporation. It's governed by the California uh, Corporations Code. It is not a Davis Sterling um, governed organization because the association owns no common property. And that's a distinct difference between Davis Sterling uh, uh, governed institutions. The example quite easily is made that, that organizations that are governed by da um, Davis Sterling are, for example, condominium projects where you have common area that is owned equally by all of the members. The legislation to support that uh, is called Davis Sterling and it's applicable to those types of projects. It is not applicable to the Palos Verdes Homes Association. Okay, um, we have a lot of duplication in questions um, and this is, uh, I think this would be directed to the incumbents. Uh, do you have a landscape arch architect on staff to govern and or influence the landscaping of city park lands? Um, and I see we begin with um, Mr. Hoffman. We have uh, such a person on the art jury, uh, but it's not <clears throat> to help out the, uh, the city. So I... I, I don't know whether the answer is yes or no. Yes, we have someone with the skills of landscape architect on the, uh, the art jury, which is the PVHA uh, arm that uh, does that, but it's not there to uh, do anything with the city other than to coordinate with the city forester as required. Somebody else care to comment? Okay. Um, I'll comment real quickly. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, it is, I think it's great that they have somebody on staff that's a landscape architect. 
Um, my only reservation is, is that it's only one person that has the knowledge of plants and design and all that, and it's a lot of responsibility and a lot of decision making for one person to make. And so that may be an area that gets expanded in the future. I also wanted to, to thank Dale for his work on the ad hoc committee. Um, I have attended those meetings and he's doing a fabulous job of delineating all the various responsibilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we begin with, with Ms. Cozen now. Um, this is a positive question. <laughs> uh, what is working well in the Palos Verdes Homes Association and its execution of its responsibilities and authorities, and what areas could benefit from change? Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. Certainly. What is working well in the PV Homes Association and its execution of its responsibilities and authorities, and what areas could benefit from change? What's working well? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we are doing, I think we're doing a good job in that uh, this year we have been working on transparency and we have uh, been doing a better job on the bulletins and at our meetings that we have had in Mirror Est, we've had a lot of members show up and a lot of interaction there. Um, we. I think that's working well. The tree remediation um, has been working smoothly. Um, okay. That's it. That's okay, it. Mr. Schott. Um, I think there's uh, more room for improvement <laughs> in several different areas. Um, I think, for instance, when people sign up at the counter, um, you know, maybe if there's more of a uh, more of a um, kind of a purpose to get email addresses and have a better email list for um, for the uh, members of the association. I think being able to contact people maybe like with a quarterly newsletter, um, have more interaction with people um, um, digitally I think is important. Um, I don't think really the associations made an effort to do that very strongly. Um, I think obviously some, I think you have some very well-intentioned people, nice people that are on the board, but I think they've made some bad decisions, especially as it relates to Parkland and not having democratic uh, elections. Okay, thank you. Mr. Franks. So I think the association, contrary to the card that you had, has, has worked very hard on making the experience for a, a member be as positive as possibly can. I think the um, archery works very hard on trying to get people's projects approved. And I think that by and large, based on my experience with people talking, is, is that there isn't the same type of negativity that's been described up here about the work that the archery does. Certainly they don't approve every single thing that comes in, but they work very hard to make sure that the architecture that is approved is the best of its kind. And um, the architectural community, um, I think knows and understands that very well. Sometimes homeowners have a hard time with it because they may desire something that isn't quite going to, to cut the muster, but with architects, they work with them, and if you come in with an architect that's knowledgeable on what the art jury is looking for, you're probably gonna have a project that goes through pretty easily. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moody. I think the Homes Association, uh, without a doubt, is the one entity that makes this community so special and keeps it special. Where it falls down, in my view, are where the, the outreach, the uh, transparency, and the ease of doing business with it. Uh, there are a couple of projects, that the, the uh, scanning of documents was I believe Ms. Cozen mentioned earlier. In my view as a risk manager, that is, is a ticking time bomb. We have records, irreplaceable records in that, that room that, that need to be scanned at, at any cost, representing what, half a trillion dollars worth of property values. Uh, procedures could be improved and I think our, our outreach needs to be improved. Ms. Breen? Um, 
One of the things that I've noticed with some submissions, and I've heard this from homeowners too, is that there seems to be a lot of focus on the little things. Do we have this color white or this color white? You know, that's a very subtle difference. When that very same building is hovering over the next door neighbor's house. And so I think a little bit of that going back to the CCNRs and reprioritizing, you know, kind of the appropriateness of some of the decisions and the type of architecture that's <clears throat> selected for a particular lot. Maybe not every style is appropriate for every lot. Um, I think they can do a better job with outreach. Um, the community needs some education. Uh, as Mr. Moody said, I mean, we have this fabulous history. And in terms of the, the documents, not only do they need to be scanned, but they need to be archived. They need to be preserved, as well as our parklands and our buildings. Uh, that's a really important piece of history. And so I would say, uh, let's go back to the CCNRs, take another good look, kind of refocus. Uh, focus more on outreach and and get those documents uh, preserved. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question, and then we'll go to the closing statements, which are one and a half, uh, which are for one and a half minutes. So this last kind of overall question, and um, we begin with Mr. Schott. Um, what are the responsibilities of the Homes Association regarding parklands, and where is this codified? Um. The responsibility that the Homes Association has for parklands is to uh, be sure that there is not anything that illegal uh, occurs with it. Um, so for instance, if there is an improper sale, if there is improper use, if there is encroachments that aren't being taken care of by uh, the city, um, actually I think the, the Homes Association has a responsibility there. Um, as a lot of people realize now, um, because of what's happened with the sale of parkland, is that the Homes Association, um, even though the city owns the land, if the city wants to dispose of land, it needs the approval from the Homes Association. That's a very important responsibility for the Homes Association. And so that's something that they, um, I think anyone here, um, especially the uh, the candidates here um, want to protect and, um, you know, we want to protect the parklands and um, uh, protect the deed restrictions and the covenants as best we can. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frank. Could you just rephrase the question so I can answer more specifically? Um, they want to know what's working well with, with the Homes Association in terms of what it's responsible for and uh, uh, I thought that we, I thought it was no. That's a prior commitment. It's a it's a parkland question. I just wanted to make sure I heard it. Sorry, correctly. <laughs> wrong question. Sorry. That's right. Uh, where, what are the responsibilities of the Homes Association regarding parklands, and where is this codified? Was the question I asked. Okay. So all responsibilities that the Homes Association had for parkland ceased in 1940 uh, for the parkland, and 1938 for the school properties when they were deeded over to the, the two entities, the school district and to the, to the city. The, the um, management and use of parkland is a city function. The Homes Association holds a reversionary right so that if the properties are not being uh, protected by the city, the Homes Association has the right of reversion, and that's in the deeds that uh, transfer the property to the, um, to the city. So that's where it's codified. Okay, um, Mr. Moody. I don't know enough about that question to give you a, a proper answer. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Breen? Um, Mr. Frings is correct uh, about the revisionary rights, and I think that's an important piece. Um, I also think on a broader scale, the Homes Association is responsible for our community character. Architecture doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in context. And when Olmsted designed our city, he actually designed the green spaces first. And then he decided where the lots were gonna go. And then they figured out what kind of architecture was gonna be there. And then they planted trees on the properties. So um, I think you have to look at the big picture as well as the specific little area that Homes Association is responsible for, because I think that they can do a lot more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hoffman. Uh, let's see. Uh, if I understand the question right, uh, let's see. The hold 
or the duty that the Homes Association has relative to parkland is to uh, make sure that the deed restrictions are obeyed. Uh, it happens that the city owns the parkland uh, so that, you know, the enforcement of what is done on it uh, is that, but uh, what's done, done on it and with it uh, must comply with the deed restrictions. So that's the covenant that covers the Homes Association responsibility. Okay, Ms. Cozen? Yes, I don't have anything to add to what Mr. Hoffman said. I would agree with okay, that. Thank you. Um, I think we can now move on to our closing statements, uh, and we'll go in reverse order. So we started on the right. We'll begin on the left this time with Mr. Hoffman. Okay, I failed to uh, give uh, due uh, service to the uh, Lanata Bay Homes Association and the uh, folks from the League of Voters. Uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity here. Uh, I think we've had uh, some interesting discussions here. They have gone a little uh, outside the boundaries of what I would consider to be the PVHA, but it's we're all part of the same neighborhood. <coughs> uh, we're all part of the same community that is very special to each and every one of us. So uh, I would just like to state that uh, I have enjoyed my uh, tenure thus far on the uh, Homes Association. I think there are many things that uh, we can improve on, many things that we can extend, uh, and I'd like the opportunity to participate in that, uh, so I would uh, ask for your vote in that regard. Thank, thank you. you very much. Ms. Cozen? I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and thank you for inviting me here. Um, I want to continue with the board's efforts um, to protect our deed restrictions and I look and I hope to uh, continue our efforts in improving our relationships with our members and continue trying to uh, create transparency and our community outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also want to uh, thank everyone for being here tonight and the uh, League of Women's Voters. Um, based on what we've heard tonight, I believe that there's legitimate concerns over recent actions by the uh, incumbents. Um, they, I think most of it has been discussed already. Uh, I don't think I need to repeat a lot of the, the claims that have been made. Um, um, one of the issues, though, I think that in the past, PVHA directors have claimed that they can't vary uh, from the bylaws, for instance, to lower the quorum requirements so that there can be a democratic elections. But the directors have uh, varied from the um, covenants in the past, the bylaws. Uh, for instance, um, they don't allow petitions like they used to. They don't allow ballots to be submitted at the annual meetings. They don't allow for uh, additional voting after an election to obtain a quorum, which they can do. Um, so there's measures like this that um, I think concern all of us that are candidates. We, we want to have an open election. We want to have a democratic. We want the people that are members of, of the homes associations and property owners to have representation, to be able to elect <clears throat> the people that serve on the board. We think that's important. And um, the current incumbents, it, it hasn't occurred in nine years. Uh, if elected to the board, I pledge to make efforts to um, uphold the intent of the deed restrictions to prevent parkland sales in the future, initiate term limit limits, make it easier for members to run for office, and develop policies that make those with the archery and the city of P PVE more in sync with one another. I respectfully ask for your vote to support our efforts of the candidates and myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Frings. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank the League, and I want to thank the Homeowners Association from Winata Bay. Um, I've enjoyed my service. I hope that I continue to serve you. Um, I love Palos Verdes. My wife grew up in this area, and I came here as a young man. And I've been fortunate to be involved for a fairly long period of time. And the reason why I'm involved is I really love Palos Verdes the way I first saw it and the, and the way it is today, and I want to maintain it that way. So I'll continue um, with your support to do that. Um, we really want a quorum. There is no, um, 
there's no reason for the incumbents to not want a quorum. And if you think that's the case, please understand that that's not the case. So please get out to your neighbors. You're a very small group of people here. We have 5,500 properties. This group here represents probably 25 properties. So there's a lot of other people that aren't showing up for this. And, and getting a quorum is not the responsibility of the board members. It's the responsibility of everybody in the community. And so if we don't get a quorum, please don't blame the incumbents. Go out and encourage people to participate so we do get a quorum. Thank you very much. I hope I have your support. Mr. Moody. Well, I believe the Homes Association, as I said earlier, is the key entity in this city that keeps it unique and keeps it as wonderful as it is. I think to a degree, the Homes Association got swept into this uh, sale of parkland, uh, not by design or its own wishes, but uh, by the failure of some people to do the jobs they should have been doing. But that's water under the bridge and we have to deal with that now. My main concern with the Homes Association, what, what is it going to do if they lose this case and the appeal is not successful? Money's going to have to be repaid. It, it is just going, it, it is a catastrophe waiting to happen and it's, it, it really frightens me. And I think what we need to have is the best management, the best board you can have that can address these problems in a non-confrontational manner. And when statements are made, be sure the statements are accurate. And we haven't had benefit of that for some years now. And it troubles me. I agree. It'd be nice to get accurate. Okay. Ms. Breen? This is quite a group to follow. <laughs> 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 I think everybody up here is qualified one way or another. Um, I guess my expertise would, would lend me to be looking at the broader topics. I do think we need to reset our priorities. Um, I'm inspired by this whole Olmstead thing and our lovely, lovely community. Um, there's just an amazing history there. And, and history is not something that's like a dead old thing that's like a, an old faded newspaper article that's at the library. We're like living history right now. And uh, I would like to, to see our community thrive and follow along the guidelines that were originally set, bring those things into the current um, uh, milieu of uh, what's going to happen today, tomorrow, for the next generation. Um, I don't know what else to, uh, to add to everyone else's work. I mean, uh, we definitely need better leadership. We need, we need a strong ship to move forward. And um, I think sometimes having new people come on board will give you a, a, fresh, uh, a fresh viewpoint and maybe a new direction and uh, a different way to handle things that have come up. So thank you. OK, thank you very much. Well, I think uh, the time now is for a closing statement. Uh, <coughs> you may not know it, but this election is really about you as, as the, those who vote. Um, so I just wanted to mention a little bit about the league. Um, we hope you will take advantage of that opportunity. And just wanted to mention something that I'm involved in called VotersEdge.org. When future elections come up, you can go onto that website to find out more about all the candidates that are running, a lot of information about them. But um, more specifically, uh, in closing right now, I'd like to extend my thanks to Nancy Marr, who is our voter service director for, for the Palos Verdes League, and Reggie Ju, who was so wonderful in helping us and assisting us uh, in, in, in arranging tonight. So I'm most grateful for that. Thanks also to our timers and those who helped sort the questions to eliminate duplication. That was Vi Ungerish, Arlene Block, and Julie Kramer. So if you haven't voted already, please note that your vote must be received by January 3rd, 2018. You heard a lot of the, the details about it earlier before we actually started. 
Uh, for member convenience, there is a secure drop box available during business hours at Palos Verdes, the State City Hall. It is monitored by the, uh, the Inspector of Elections. Um, the Board of Directors election is scheduled for Tuesday, January 9th. And I think before closing, we need to give a round of applause to our candidates for being here. We held it last year on December 14th. It was a little earlier last year, but this year is a little later. So uh, remember, your vote is your voice. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much. You did very well.